Good morning. Our text this morning is in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Jesus introduces himself to the church in Philadelphia with an interesting image. He calls himself the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. And we have seen Jesus with keys before in Revelation. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 17, John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. So we have seen Jesus with keys before. Now I want us to notice what Jesus is talking about. When he, at least here in chapter 1, he's talking about the keys of death and Hades. This is right on the tail of what he has said about his own new life. He says, I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He has crossed from death over into eternal life. And because of the power of his resurrection, he has the power to open that door for others also. He has the keys of death and Hades. He has the power to empty the grave to open it up, to give new life to those who have lost their lives. And so Jesus introduces himself as the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Not only does he have the power over death, but he also has the authority over life and death. He has the key associated with David, the king. He has the authority to open so that no one will shut, the authority to shut so that no one will open. And this almost immediately translates into a promise for the church at Philadelphia. Notice he starts his direct message to the church the same way that he starts the, the message to all of the other churches. I know your works. Jesus has said that in every letter up to this point, or some variation of it, right? In some places he said, I know your trials, I know your patient suffering, I know what you're enduring. But in every letter, he starts with those words, I know. Jesus has seen what's going on. Now, usually at this point, this is where he would start talking about what those works are. He would start talking about what they've done right, and what they need to correct. Jesus doesn't do that here yet. In fact, we'll notice Philadelphia is one of only two churches that Jesus has nothing bad to say about. Smyrna was the other one that we've seen already. He has nothing bad to say about Philadelphia. He has no correction to offer them, only the admonition to keep on doing what they're doing. 
Instead, he jumps immediately into promise. He says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. Because of Philadelphia's righteous conduct, they have the door of eternal life open right in front of them. That promise is sure for them if they remain faithful to Jesus Christ. And then Jesus turns his attention briefly to what their works are. And I want you to notice, by the way, this is, this is all that we get about the works at Philadelphia. Jesus has very little to say about it. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, this is consistent with everything else that we've read in the other letters, right? Everything good and everything bad that Jesus has had to say about all of the other churches is centered around these things, right? Whether, the, whether or not they have kept his word and whether or not they have denied his name. But you can really boil it down to those two things, right? Are we confessing Jesus as Christ? Are we staying faithful to the name of Christ? And are we keeping his word? Are we doing his works? And Jesus doesn't get into any details with Philadelphia. He just simply says that they're doing it. Right? So what are they, you know, what exactly are they doing? Well, I mean, we could, we could spend a long time developing an answer from the rest of the New Testament. But we don't really need to. The short answer, I think, is sufficient. They are faithful. Whatever we can read in any other place in the New Testament about uh, churches upholding the word and works of Jesus Christ, Philadelphia has been doing it. Whatever we can read about confessing the name of Christ, bearing witness to him in the world, Philadelphia has been doing it, despite the fact that by worldly standards, they are insignificant. He says, I know that you have but little power. By the standards of this world, Philadelphia is quite small. And yet, it doesn't take any sort of worldly power, it doesn't take any sort of worldly esteem to be able to maintain the faith of Jesus Christ, to keep his words, and to confess his name. That should be a great encouragement to us. All right? In any kind of circumstance we find ourselves, um, you know, I've, I've grown up in, uh, in remote places with small congregations. I've grown up in places where, uh, well, I've been in places where there are just not very many faithful people. Um, and I know from experience that sometimes you can look around and feel discouraged, right, if you let worldly thinking in, if you let you know, worldly standards for success in. And what Jesus is telling Philadelphia is that those worldly standards are irrelevant. What's important, Philadelphia has. And they have it so well that, he has, that Jesus has already told them, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. We know also that Philadelphia has been faithful in persecutions and in trials. He says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Philadelphia has been through persecutions. Jesus says that that's going to end. Right? Persecution does not last forever. Jesus preaches endurance, the, the need for patience, for strength to all Christians, to all churches. But he also tells us that those kinds of persecutions, those kinds of trials will not last forever. They have, again, they have an expiration date, like we have said in other places. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, he says, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Philadelphia is in such a position in terms of their faith that they have, he says, they've learned the lesson. 
right? You have kept my word about patient endurance. They have allowed, uh, well, if we were to, to phrase this in terms of what James says in James chapter one about suffering, right? They've allowed that suffering and their enduring through suffering to have its perfect result so that they are growing up in the faith. Jesus says, you've got that, right? So he set the open door in front of them. He's told them that the trials are going to end and that they, in fact, are going to be spared from the trials and tribulations that Jesus is going to send on the world, at least some of them. The only thing that Jesus encourages them to do is to hold fast, to continue looking forward to his arrival. He says, I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. And again, I want you to notice just how, in all of this, we can say that Jesus is speaking proleptically, right? He's, he's talking about the future as if it's already arrived. All right, we've seen it with the open door. It's already in front of them, right? They can just step through into eternal life. Right, the, the trials, the tribulations, they're over. Look at this. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The crown, I mean, we, we look forward to, is something that's almost a, an entirely future thing. Right? In fact, Jesus has spoken of the crown in other places in these letters. In fact, I want to say that it was in Smyrna. Yes, yeah, so you go back to chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer, he tells Smyrna. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's the way that we're used to talking about the crown, the way that we're used to thinking about it. It's a future thing. But righteousness is a crown to the Christian. So that Jesus is able to speak to the saints in Philadelphia as if they already have their crowns. They just need to hold on to it. All right, that's not to say that they're perfect in the absolute sense of the word. That's not to say that they've already gone on to their reward. I mean, they're still very much alive in the city of Philadelphia. But the course of their faith has been run so well uh, their faith is trending in the right direction so thoroughly that Jesus is able to speak to them in this way. That to those who keep Jesus' word, the, the promise is that certain. That Jesus is able to speak to them as if they have already received the promises. They merely need to hold on to them. And the promises continue. Oh, just notice, by the way, how much of this letter has consisted of promise. So little of it has consisted of what Philadelphia has actually done, what has happened to them. Again, it was so simple. You've, you've kept my word. You've not denied my name. And all of the rest of it has been promise. The one who conquers, he says, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. Right, what Jesus promises us, if we are faithful, is a place with God, a home with God forever, one that cannot be revoked, one that cannot be taken away from us. It is so certain and so permanent that it's like we're built into it. He says, I'm going to make you a pillar in the, temple, in the temple of my God. And I will write on him the name of my God. All right, here Jesus begins to confess a great mystery to us. Here we have a set of promises that, honestly, we, we can't really explain. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. All right, we could probably, I mean... I'm sure there are people out in the world who have spilled gallons of ink over this last comment, my own new name. Oh, what's the new name of Jesus? And every gallon of that ink has been wasted. It's a mystery. We're not told. But that's the point. 
is that the promised reward is that we get to be fully implicated into this mystery. We, we get to receive the blessings of this mystery. We don't know what these names are that are written down, but if we are faithful, one day we will. That's the promise. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the call this morning is for us to remain faithful and to hold fast to these promises which we are guaranteed in Jesus Christ. These promises are certain and they are abundant. It doesn't matter what kind of worldly influence, what kind of worldly power we may hold. If we are faithful to the end, we have the door open to us. We have the crown set on our heads. It is merely ours to hold on to that crown and walk through that door. So we invite all who are with us this morning, if you have not chosen to follow Jesus, if you have not confessed his name and kept his word, as the saints in Philadelphia had done. We invite you to begin following Jesus. Repent of your sins, confess him as Lord, be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins, and live faithfully as Philadelphia has done. If you're subject to the call, once you come, as together we stand and sing. <laughs>